Turn it on. Good morning. Thanks for joining us for worship here at Grace Lutheran Church. Those of you who joined us on TV, we pray that we are a blessing to you. Our first hymn is Come Holy Ghost God and Lord. So let's uh, sing that. We'll rise on the last verse. There's only three. We begin in the name of the only true God, the triune God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us. 
and has given his only son to die for us, and for his sake he forgives all of our sins. Now to those who believe on his name, he gives the power to become the children of God, and he bestows upon them his Holy Spirit. May he who has begun this bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house. Glory be to God on high. The Lord be with each of you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, defend your church from all false teaching and error, that your faithful people may confess you to be the only true God and rejoice in your good gifts of life and salvation. We ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah, chapter 29, verses 11 through 19. The vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, Read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, Read this, he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, Because this people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men, Therefore, behold, I will again do wondrous things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord, your counsel who need, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, Who sees us? 
Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay that the thing made should be should save its maker? He did not make me. Or the thing formed by him who formed it? He has no understanding. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be returned into a fruitful field? And the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest. In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of their blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is recorded in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to the Christ, so also wives should submit to everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of this body. Therefore, a man shall leave his mother and father and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The gospel for this 14th Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in the gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter beginning with the first verse. When the Pharisees gathered to Jesus with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all of the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots, the copper vessels, and the dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. You leave the commandments of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to establish your tradition. But Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is korban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. Thus, making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. This is the gospel of the Lord.
If you would, please be seated. We've switched the position of the creed for this Sunday. And let us come together and sing how sweet the name of Jesus sounds. Jesus sounds in a believer's ears. It soothes one's sorrows, heals our wounds, and drives away our tears. God's grace and his peace be with each of you today through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to talk about something that's going to rattle some people. I've already seen it when, before worship when someone asked why that picture was on the front of the worship folder. And someone said, well, because it's dealing with husbands and wives How many of you read Portals of Prayer this morning? Oh, three people. Um, You should, because Portals of Prayer dealt with it as well. The second lesson is a difficult one for many people. Both husband and wives seem to reject it. How many of you believe God's Word. Well, thank you for those who rose their hands. Two, the rest of you don't. Well, sometimes that's obvious because of how we react to God's Word. This text deals with the marriage of a biological man and a biological woman, as designed by God. It deals with the relationship between a husband and a wife. And if we believe God's Word, we believe that the Holy Spirit lays it out as being similar to the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. For the feminist... And the alphabet group, the second lesson for the 14th Sunday after Pentecost is most likely in this country at the top of the most hated verses in the Bible. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people that claim to be Christian that disregard these verses as irrelevant in their lives. 
the principles given to us by the Holy Spirit in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 28, they're not suggestions and they're not antiquated ideas. They're just not. They lay out the relationship that we have with our Savior, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, especially our relationship with Christ. But in many, many, many marriages, there's a power struggle. Oh, and it is of political proportions. In verse 22 through 24, and you'll notice there's only two verses. It says this. Paul speaks to Christian wives. Wives, submit to your husbands in all things as Christ submitted, as you submitted to Christ, and Christ submitted to the church. The word submit is what seems to hackle everybody. Well, at least the ladies. But did you know that submission is an attribute of the Christian faith? It is. Not just for the women, but for the men as well. In verse 21, we find that we are to submit ourselves to one another. But for some reason, submission seems to be very difficult when it comes to submitting to a husband. It seems to be a very hard command of God to follow. Yet in Hebrews 13, we are to submit to our pastors In 1 Peter chapter 2, we are to submit to the lawgivers and to the laws that they give. In 1 Peter 5, we are to submit to the elders. There are verse after verse after verse that say that we are to submit to God and His Word. I wonder if Christians actually do what God asks. We submit to many people and agencies every single day. But you may notice that only submitting to husbands garners hatred by the so-called enlightened people in the world today. Well, they don't like Christ either. Why? Because... Because they hate God's word. Now, I know hate is a strong word, but that's what it is. They do not want to hear what God has to say about a relationship between a husband and a wife. And the weird thing is, they always stop after the verse that says, wives submit to your husbands in all things as the church submits to Christ. Remember what Jesus says. It's not that they hate you first, but is is that they hate me first. And they hate God's word. Because God's word lays down principles for life that work. But submission? Think about how many people you submit to every single day. As the church, the believers are subject to their leader. Who's that? Jesus Christ. And in God's word, Christ's word, the wife is to be subject to her leader the husband. Now, again, I'll say, listen, don't argue with me. I'm just the messenger. 
If you've got a problem with this text, argue with God. He might answer you. Go to his word, and he does answer you. We are to submit to God and his word. And the word says that we are, as wives, to submit to our husbands. As Christians in general, we are to submit to the authorities over us. And it goes on to point out that the husband is the savior of the body. Now, you've got to understand this does not mean he is the savior as Jesus is. It says the savior of the body, not the savior of the soul. Now, this means that the husband is the provider, the protector of his wife and his family, the preserver of of the faith that they should be living in. That means he is responsible to God for his wife as a Christian is responsible to the Lord. God has placed, believe it or not, the ladies in an exalted position. But our modern mentality has made it seem outdated at best an antediluvian at its worst. Ladies, I'm addressing you. The one thing Abaddon, the destroyer, the devil wants is to destroy the church, which you and your family are a part. Now, the easiest way to destroy the church is to... to be a supposed enlightened society is to destroy the home. The capstone of the home is the relationship between the husband and the wife. The cornerstone upon which the relationship is built is God's word. God lays out his principles as to the relationship that is supposed to exist between a Christian husband and a Christian wife in a Christian marriage. But the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature gets in the way, and the so-called modern wife rejects what God has commanded. But the funny thing is, those who say they believe in Christ and they trust his word seem to act the same way. And that's difficult for the relationship within the family. Destroy the family, destroy the church. So it's easier to go after the family than it is the church. One small entity of the church can be broken. The church as a whole cannot. I went to cook some spaghetti the other day. I know I should not eat spaghetti. And I took a couple of pieces and I broke them and threw them in the pot. And I didn't want to waste time, so I grabbed a chunk of spaghetti and I went to break it. It wasn't what? It wasn't that easy to break. Because the more there was, the harder it was to overcome it. But as Satan attacks the body individually, he can destroy the family and in so doing destroy the church eventually. And this idea of submission is one that our society revolts against. But sometimes I, I have to sympathize with the ladies. The way some men act, throwing this text into the face of their wives can bring about rebellion and rebellious attitudes. So many women demonstrate today that rebellion against submission. Guys, your wife is not a second-class person in your relationship. She is your helpmate. 
That means she walks with you, right beside you. It doesn't mean that you're better than her. Realize that, ladies, and realize that, husbands. When I was a platoon sergeant, the first sergeant was my supervisor or leader. He was not better than the platoon sergeants, and in some ways he wasn't smarter than many of them. But he relied on his platoon sergeants for many things, and he trusted us to carry out his orders. For he was ultimately responsible for the everyday operation of that company. And we were responsible to him. And we had to submit to him. And sometimes that wasn't easy to do. Husbands, you are responsible to God because you are responsible for the family just as the first sergeant was responsible to the captain for that company. You're responsible to God as provider, preserver, and protector of that family and that wife. Guys, just as the wife has a duty to submit to you and to be your helpmate, not an irritant, either one of you, you need to realize your duty to God and to your wife. The next four verses in Ephesians 5, 25, 6, 7, and 8, you'll notice there were two for the ladies. There are four for you. Submission is one thing, and when it is put in its proper place, it's not difficult to do, ladies. But here's the kicker, guys. Husbands, according to God's word, you are to love your wife even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. She only has to submit, supposedly, to a loving Christian husband. And if you're not, you better hope your pastor never finds out about it. But you are to give your life for your wife, just as Christ gave his life for the church. He gave his life for it because he cherished it. He loved it. And you husbands are to love your wife in the exact same way. You are to cherish her above all earthly things. She is a gift given to you by God to help you in your responsibility to the family, to her and to your children. For you, she should mean more than anything else, definitely more than your cars, definitely more than your friends who you may go down to the local bar with, more than a fishing trip. She is everything for you in this life on this earth. And she is God's gift. And you need to cherish it. As a helpmate, she's there to lend her knowledge in situations so that you can determine the best course of action to take. And as a helpmate, we need to listen to her. I found after 54, 55 years that there are things that I am not good at that God is. And there are things she's found that she's not good that I am. And we combine that together to accomplish the task that God has set before us. And it works when we work together. But none of us measure up, no, not one. We all have a sinful nature. And we all have our own egos. And when we put those into operation, the marriage can, if we are not careful, 
fall apart at any given time. And Satan sits there and laughs. Every time a husband forgets his duty to his wife and his God, and every time a wife forgets her duty to her husband and her God. Brothers and sisters, don't succumb to the ploys of the devil, the world, and your own sinful wills. What God has for us, when we live it properly, when we follow what Christ through the Holy Spirit, has laid out for us to follow, gives us great joy. To follow the dictates of the world which reject God's word, which tell you that you are equal to and better when you don't worry about what a husband does, do your own thing, in the end only brings pain, Grief and heartbreak. Back in the uh, 60s and 70s, a trend started. It was called the 50-50 marriage. Do you remember it? Well, guess what? It didn't work. Divorce rates actually went up a little bit after they started uh, applying the 50-50 marriage. Because what happened? There was no what? There was no head. Do you know how many marriages end in divorce? You can shout it out. It's going to be wrong most of the time. Too many, yes. That's a very safe answer, Walt. You're told 50%. Actually, it's more like 30%. Back when the 50-50 marriage came into being, the uh, divorce rate kind of went up. And they predicted that if this trend kept going, eventually it would hit 50%. Well, what happened to the 50-50 marriage? It kind of went by the wayside. And the divorce rate has kind of um, trickled out at 30%, roughly. We base the 50 on the projection that might have happened. And we've taken it as the truth, and it's really a myth. But when a husband and a wife cannot work things out together, there's always going to be friction. And friction can, in the end, cause a disillusion of the marriage. A woman once said, I'll submit to my husband, well, as long as it does not cross me. And I imagine somewhere a couple talked about having a 50-50 marriage. And when the wife was asked what they did when they could not agree, she had one thing to say, my way or the couch. The guy just stomps off and goes down to the bar for a couple of beers and to complain to his friends. That doesn't heal the wound. Marriages that are not based on the grace of God and the love of God for us are going to be very rocky. They may last, but they could become loveless. And a marriage between two supposed Christians that is not based in the word of God can also become quite rocky. And end the same way. Headship is not a dictatorship. But there needs to be a head. When you cannot come to an equitable agreement one has to make the decision. And according to God, that's the husband. But if the husband is loving and cherishing his wife the way he is, he's going to listen to her and give his life over to her. And that means that at times he's going to what? He's going to take that advice and make his decision accordingly. 
I wanted a, another vehicle. Well, we need another vehicle. One vehicle's not enough. Because there's things we have to do. I saw a van that I wanted. Unfortunately, it's in Florida, and I have to fly to go get it. It's not new. It's 24 years old. But it is a nice-looking conversion van. It's only got 127,000 miles on it, but it's 24 years old. And this thing is driving me crazy. Well, I asked her about it, and we discussed it. I really wanted that van. And if, it, if I was single, I would probably have gone and gotten that van. But how reliable could it be? Well, it's been there, I told her, for a month and a half. There must be something wrong with it. How much is the insurance going to be? What's the gas mileage? Especially the way we travel and in today's atmosphere. And I had to research what she said and come to a decision. Do I buy that van or do I weigh up what I have researched about her question to make the decision. Well, I made the decision. No, don't buy the van. It is 24 years old. You cannot get extended warranties on a van that old. Even with car shields, you can't get it. It only gets 12 miles to the gallon. At the prices today, we're planning a trip. If I take my vehicle, it gets 30 miles to the gallon. If I had that van and took it, it would triple, almost triple the cost of the gasoline. And 4,500 miles is a lot of gasoline. So I said, no, I really want that van. But I have to take in her advice. And she has to submit sometimes to my decision. That's operating the way we are supposed to. That's being a Christian husband and wife. She is my helpmate. God has gifted me with her. Do you know what the word Dorothy means? God's gift. I got it both ways. So I listen most of the time. But just like anyone else, there are times when, hey, this is what I'm going to do. And there are times when it's, hey, I'm not going to listen to him. And those are the times when friction begins. And we have to get back on track. We have to admit, Lord, we've sinned. Forgive us and help us to live our life in your grace with you and with each other. You know, being a Christian husband and wife is not easy because Satan is going to try to destroy you. But if you keep your eyes on the cross and on the Lord and on his word and you willingly, as you have submitted to him and his word, submit to each other, and that's what this is talking about, but the modernists only key in on verse 22. They forget about what God asks of the husband. The wife is to submit to her husband, but the husband is to give his life for his wife. Who has the more difficult responsibility? Not the wife. Because if he, she has a loving husband who cherishes her, she is going to truly be blessed. That's why I said that the ladies have an exalted place within the church and within the home. You're married. And I know some of you have had more than one marriage. Think about it. I was listening to a person giving advice to women on YouTube. And she's giving all of this advice 
this advice about how best to make your marriage work. And she said, I know what I'm talking about. I've been divorced three times. She sure did know what she was talking about, but not what God's talking about. Put your hope and trust in him and his word and submit wives to your husbands and husbands to your wives. And I can guarantee you, you will be blessed. Now, may the peace of God, which surpasses our understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, let me get my book. Now, that wasn't that difficult to take, was it? At this time, I'm going to ask you to rise. Oh, no, sit. Where? Where? where yeah, uh, this is Lutheran calisthenics. Up, down, up, down. Where you are in your place, let's together, before we receive the offering, confess our faith through the words of the creed. I believe Amen. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From hence he will come to the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Would you please receive the offering? I used a word in the sermon, uh, antediluvian. Do you know what that means? Before the flood. Well, it could. It means prehistoric is what it means. So uh, that's what that word means if you, if you don't know um, what it meant. So um, if you would, please rise for prayer. And, you know, it, I, I, I'm standing out here, and I'm, I'm so thrilled. I'm looking here. There are four generations. I'm looking over here. And there is a fourth generation. Um, this congregation is blessed. It truly is. Okay? It's got father, daughter, granddaughters. It's got father, mother, sons, daughters, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. We are truly a blessed congregation, one that God blesses with a multi-generational group. Think about that when you think about your church and always give glory to God. Most gracious God, we thank you for the church. The church is made up of those who believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. But like any group, including marriages, sometimes we step out of our role. And Satan attacks. Lord, help us to remember who we are, what we are, and how we should be reacting as your church in the very midst of the society that we live in. We're not part of this society. We're in it, but we're not of it. We are of you. Help us to recommit ourselves to that commitment that we make to you.
and your word, and in turn, our commitment we make to each other. Lord, in your mercy, we pray, Lord, for Brian, who has pneumonia. And if you haven't had it, it's sometimes really difficult to, to understand because it will sap your strength. And of a person Brian's age, it can be something fatal. Strengthen Brian in his body, Lord, as you have strengthened his soul. We commend him to you, trusting in your will for him. Use his doctors, nurses, and the medications that we have to combat the pneumonia so that Brian can be back among us again and leading his family. Lord, in your mercy for our nation, bless it and strengthen it. Help it to turn its eyes back to you, away from its national sins, and heed your word. And in doing so, bring your blessings down upon it. Lord, in your mercy, be with our synod, district, and our congregation. Strengthen and preserve them in your word and help them, Lord, to truly be a blessing to those around them by living that word, not just preaching it. Sometimes we become pictures to others, and a picture can be worth a thousand words. Help us to be mindful of our actions and how it doesn't just affect us and those around us, but it affects how people look at our church as well. Lord, in your mercy, for healing, for TC, for Cooper, who's still having problems with back pain, with Jerry, with his heart, Amber, who's responding to the treatments for brain tumors, Mark, who has a kidney infection, for Gerald, who, Lord, will not be coming home, but will have to go to a care center, And for Kelly, Lord, we, we, we give you praise and glory for his recovery. Lord, in your mercy, for Mark, who has an upcoming surgery on a gallbladder and on a hip replacement, place your hand of healing upon him and help him heal swiftly from these surgeries. Lord, in your mercy, for Steve, who is having a birthday, bless him, Lord, who does so much for us as he seems to be our only video technician who um, is helped by Robert. Bless their ministry, Lord, because it gets this program out to the world. Lord, in your mercy, for Thani and Kim, who are celebrating an anniversary, we thank you for the years that you've given to them, and we pray for many more. In your hands, O oh Lord, we place our military, who have put themselves in harm's way. For Austin and Brittany, for Marcus and Nicholas, keep them safe, Lord, as they put their life before us and danger. In your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all of those for whom we pray, trusting in your word and praying that prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father,
receive the blessings of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his everlasting peace. If you would, please be seated, and we'll close with our final hymn.